it is my pleasure to introduce Sherry Runner, who is the president and CEO of the Urban League. Do you want me to read this whole bio? <laughs> Sherry said none of that. Um, I am actually going to let her come up and um, introduce the panel. Again, we're going to move expeditiously because I think we want to get into the meat of today's discussion. So uh, let's look forward to a hearty, um, honest discussion. No, I'll be okay. I think for a, for a minute, yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you everybody uh, for being here today for this very important discussion um, about our youth. I am honored and uh, to moderate this discussion with this very esteemed and knowledgeable panel. Uh, the panel's name today is Making a Difference for Chicago Youth in 2016. And I, I'm sure that that is something that all of us agree upon, uh, we all have to do. Uh, we must do it with vigor and with robustness. Uh, it is a very important uh, topic. I'm looking forward to a very frank and honest discussion. I think that based on our current political se uh, season and the candidates that we have, uh, that we can all say any and everything that we want to without, uh, <laughs> without any, uh, any, any fear. Um, Though the title of the panel is uh, Generic Chicago Youth, the composition of the panelists suggests that we are talking about youth of color. Um, racial, economic, and social gaps remain seemingly insurmountable for these youth. One in three under the, eight, uh, under the age of 18 live in poverty, and a disproportionately high number of them continue to be driven into the achievement and opportunity gap. Uh, this is the workforce pipeline. This, these are the consumers of the future. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very clear about who they are, what their future will be like, and what we need to do to support and mentor them. So without further ado, I um, will welcome to the panel uh, Rufus Williams. He is the executive director of BBF Family, and I always screw this up, Ruth, Services. Uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves so that they will tell you who they are uh, more perfectly. Uh, Haki Madubuti. He is the president and CEO, uh, I'm sorry, he is the founder of Third World Press author, educator, and activist, and Juan Salgado, who is the president and CEO of Instituto del Progreso Latino. So we're going to start today um, with each of these gentlemen um, giving a few minutes on their initial perspectives on today's topic. And then we'll get into some more specific questions and answers. So, Rufus? Good afternoon. It's, um, first of all, thank you all for being here. This is a topic different than what the City Club typically does. So, uh, I appreciate that you appreciate the importance of this topic. And thanks to the City Club for, for having such a, a panel in such an important time. Uh, just in context, I grew up in a two-parent household in North Lawndale. I was the fifth of six children. Uh, we moved from North Lawndale to West Garfield, West Garfield Park. I attended Lane Tech and I graduated from Orr High Schools. I've experienced what it's like not to be able to get a job after not having enough money to go to college. But with the help of the Better Boys Foundation, which I now lead, um, I was able to get to college. I have since served on the boards of Providence St. Mel School, of Francis W. Parker School. I was the president of the local school council at Whitney Young, and I was the president of the Chicago Board of Education. With my wife, I have raised two successful children, one a young male in Chicago, which is generally an endangered species. I now work as the president and CEO of BBF Family Services, which we renamed from the Better Boys Foundation, on the west side of Chicago. For context, North Lawndale is an extreme example 
of segregated black communities in Chicago. Think about Roseland or Austin, Austin Gresham, think about Inglewood. Uh, it's also a microcosm of what takes place in the country. If you think about St. Louis, or you think about Baltimore, or you think about areas in Los Angeles. The current population in Lawndale is 36,000 people. Mm -hmm. It was 112,000 people in 1930. North Lawndale is typically noted as one of the top three violent neighborhoods in Chicago. The median household income is $26,000 per year, and 45% of all of our households are on food stamps. In, 19, in 1890, Londell was predominantly Czechoslovakian. In 1920, the area was predominantly Jewish. In 1960, the area was predominantly black. And once it started becoming black, uh, it was pretty quick. There was white flight, there were scare tactics, there was redlining, there was contract leasing, and there was the resulting diminishing property values. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lived in Lawndale. After his assassination in 1968, 75% of the businesses in the community were gone by 1970. International Harvester left in 1969. Sears Roebuck and Company, which had its world headquarters there, was gone by 1987. Zenith and Sunbeam left in the 70s. Western Electric left in the 80s. No one has returned. This disinvestment has led to abject general, generational poverty, joblessness, an underground economy, ensuing violence, challenged schools, and a precipitous population decline that I already described. Policies, and yes, racist policies in some cases, have made life extraordinarily difficult for residents of North Lawndale and communities like it. Segregation, unfair housing practices, redlining, contract leasing are among the things that have brought a special kind of poverty to blacks in Lawndale. I'm not certain how to describe the policing that has occurred on the west side of Chicago. But if you think of Rakia Boyd, Laquan McDonald, Quintario LeGreer, and Betty Jones, who all died recently after being shot by police, then you understand the challenge of people in this area and the challenges they have with authority. Policies that allow these victims' murders to go unaccounted for also allow the lawlessness between the citizens of our community to be the order of the day. In the face of all this, we are focused and hopeful in making the difference in the lives of Chicago's youth in Lawndale. We have programs that immediately impact and empower our youth and, the fam and their families. We mentor with the help of Get In Chicago. We have a baseball program coming up with the help of Get In Chicago. We get good support from After School Matters. We get support from the Chicago Community Trust. Um, we have a strong education program. We have employment services. We have great after and out of school programming. We're looking to provide, and we continue to provide cultural apprenticeships to our young people. And while we have these programs, that's progress, but we are intimately aware that policy is power. We're thoughtful about what happens to our youth and to the families and their families, and we look to each of you to help us forge new policies and help provide hope and opportunity that has been, lo that has been lost to the existing, existing long-standing prejudices. We need clear policies that halt and, and reverse these symptoms. Uh, I'd like to recognize my team from BBF who's sitting right up here uh, for all the work that they do. Raise your hands, people. Let the folks know you're here. And I mentioned a number of our collaborators who actually help us bring hope to this very desperate environment. I'm grateful to the City Club again for having this discussion, and, and I look forward to delving deeper into these issues. Thank you, Rufus. And before we go on, since you did that, I'm, I'm going to have to recognize my table of the Chicago Urban League. Why don't you guys stand up and, say, and be recognized? <laughs> You're awesome. Um, Haki, would you like to continue? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is my first time uh, at this very important body. Um, I come here as a representative of the you know, black community on the south side of Chicago, specifically the four schools that we mm -hmm. operate, 
the uh, Betty Shabazz International Charter School, the uh, Barbara Ann Sizemore Academy, which we just had a big fight with the city over, uh, Dusab Alicia Academy, and the New Science Concept School. <clears throat> I found the Third World Press in 1967 in my basement apartment in Inglewood with $400 in the mimeograph machine. I've been involved in this community uh, all my adult life. And I finished school at Dunbar High School, uh, in terms of high school. I grew up around pimps and hoes, slamming cat like those on the west side of Chicago, and have never forgotten where I come from. My, I lost my mother at 34 years old. She was in the sex trade. Um, my sister had a f six children before the age of 26 years old. And so I went into the Army at 18 in order to, it was a poor boy's answer to unemployment. And while in the military, I had been bitten by the bug of literature and reading and, and Du Bois, who became one of my major uh, heroes, I uh, began to read close to a book a day for two and a half, two years and ten months. Came out of the military, went to school in J.I. Bill of Rights. I taught in the academy for 42 years. My last assignment was at uh, DePaul University. I was pretty much pushed out of, do, uh, pushed out of Chicago State University because I challenged the incompetence and the uh, corruption of the president. And it's true. And what I find in this city and I find across the country, cowardice, corruption, and dishonesty. I have a new book out. It just came out. I won't hit the bookstores until the 20th. It's called Taking Bullets, Terrorism, and Black Life in 21st Century America, Confronting White Nationalism, White Supremacy, Privilege, Plutocracy, and Oligarchy. And what we keep covering up <clears throat> is the history of this country. <laughs> Susan Sontag, who's a major uh, SAS and fiction writer and filmmaker, wrote something in one of her books uh, many years ago, Styles of Radical Will. She writes, and I quote, the white race is the cancer of human history, it is the white race and it alone, its ideologies and inventions, which eradicates autonomous civilizations wherever it spreads, which has upset the ecological balance of the planet, which now threatens the very existence of life itself, end quote. This book came about as a result of the many young boys and women and girls being killed across this nation by the nation's so-called law enforcement agencies. When they killed Tamir Rice, I couldn't sleep. A 12-year-old boy rolled up on by Cleveland's finest, and less than 12, 12 seconds, he's dead. And so I would get up every morning at 4.30 and write. And what I found absolutely necessary is that we have to change the conversation, we have to be very honest about the conversation. But one of the real problems in this country is a lack of history. That we do not understand the history, do not know the history, and therefore there is no reference to the history, unless it's very, very uh, near to, to us. Europe is attached to the United States as a shared culture, history, values, economics, and so forth. And so we must understand Europe's place in terms of the United States history, most certainly Europe's place in terms of the whole concept of race. And of course, race, which is fundamentally a social construct in this country, is not only the exception to the culture, it drives the culture. Race drives the culture. Race also dictates that we, as black poets, writers, scholars, workers at all levels, must be involved in this conversation on a daily basis. What I'm going to say now may shock you, but it is true. In the West, most certainly in the United States, white people never, and I say never, have to think about being white. Being white is an accepted, normal, and privileged existence. However, black people, African Americans, everywhere in the world, especially in the United States, must think about and deal with being black every day of the year. And this is amplified in the, the darker one's complexion. Dark-skinned black men and women have a storm to no negotiate each day they step outside of their family and comfort zone. All the white systems of organization, control, definition, have been in place to keep black men and women out, to reduce black people's struggle, and this is very important, to reduce black people's struggle and the definitions of their race, our race, to people of color is a display in ignorance reserved for newborn babies. We must never diminish the critical power that black carries in a white supremacist culture. And what is very clear to me, I'm 74 years old, 
In the 60s, we fighting the same thing we fought 50 years ago. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. And the problem I have is our politicians and those people who represent us, it's all the data. It's all the data. But these lives, these lives, and one of the real problems I have with our leadership and the leadership in this country, they don't love black people. They don't love black people. What have we done to deserve this? What have we done to deserve this? You rape us from a continent, you drop us around the Western world, you enslave us for years, hundreds of years here to build this country on the backs of black people. Forget about reparations, forget about restitution. You know what I'm saying? All that's in the past, all that's in the past. And you therefore develop a white supremacist culture built upon white nationalist uh, 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 premises and white skin privileges. And then, you know, why are you not putting yourself up by your blue steps? You don't have any blue steps, all right? And this is very clear. If all 42 million plus black people in the United States disappear tomorrow, there's not one job, one position, appointment, post, function, manager, executive, professorship, CEO, CFO, general of the military, etc., now being held by black people, including the president of the United States, that could not be filled within a week by white people in this nation. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're graduating young white people, black people, Hispanic people, Native American people, they can't even get a damn job. Why? Because we do not understand what has happened now. Over the last 30 some odd years, most certainly since Reagan, the whole economic system has moved toward the 1%, less than 1 in 1%, and the 99% on the street. That's what Occupy was about. That's what Ferguson in many cases was about. That's what the, you know, Black Lives Matter is about. And we don't want to begin to understand that essentially this separation between the money, t between the, 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 the people who are running the ownership and those of us who try to do some work, well, if we can get some work, they don't understand what's going on. And within the context of that, black people and Native American Hispanics, we're at the bottom. At the bottom. Don't talk to me about a job. When you move all the industry out of the cities into China, into Mexico, into where, India, wherever, you, you, you deplete the, the, the center cities of, of employment, and then you lock down those cities and, sit, and, and the educa education, the worst, close 50 schools. They're closing our high school, now try to close our K through eight. What do you do? And Clinton, with the, 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 the crime bill, let's not gloss over this. That crime bill and three, three counts are out, it hurt us and Hispanics. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of young brothers locked up in these prisons across the country and don't talk about the effect of those hundreds of thousands of young brothers being locked up on their families and their children. Don't talk about that. So Clinton comes along, messing with Monica Lucy and everybody else, and so we're trying to put build this stuff up, deal with the welfare bill, locked it down, three strikes you out, mandatory sentencing, all right, and going on. Now, this is the key, and I, I know I'm going too long, but let me yeah, just say we this have like, we, we need to. Well, let me just say this one point. You lock over 100,000, uh, I write in my book, there's 1.5 million black men missing in this country. Most of them in prison. Most of my prisoners can't read at a sixth or seventh grade level. You can't read at a sixth or seventh grade level, you can't write at a fourth or fifth grade level. So when you come out, what do you do? You go back into the black community. You can't read, you can't write, you can't join the, 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 the education economy, economy. You go back into the underground economy. That's what you do. That's how you make a living. And then you become the victim again. And so the victimizers get sent, yeah, okay. Get the book, it's all in the book. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm sorry, I, let me just introduce my son, uh, my son, Keely, Keely Malcolm, stand up, Keely. Here's the uh, Juan, yeah. do you want to follow that? Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I have no choice. <laughs> so the show must go on, and um, first of all, I want to make sure I recognize that I'm honored to be in this program and on this panel with all of you are. I'm honored that we're having this conversation today. Um, I'm a kid that grew up on 125th and Ash, and I grew up in a Mexican household in an African-American community. Um, I got my extra inspiration for doing community development work, uh, doing volunteer work for three years while in graduate school in East St. Louis, mm -hmm. Illinois, right? So what's in my heart 
is about every child, not just Latino children. But I do work with Latino children every single day because it's important that we work with all of our children. It's important that we grow and develop all of our children. And um, I want to just say a little bit today about uh, you know, who we are and what we do uh, and, and how we look at what we do and how it might uh, have some applicability to the topic we have today. So our basic belief that education is a power and freedom to live and enjoy the best that this country has to offer. We work actually more with families than we do the children, right? And I think that's a pretty good ratio. You work with 10,000 families a year, you work with 1,000 young people a year because part of what we have to do is work with the parents, Right? When you get on a plane, they say, you know, put the oxygen mask on for yourself as a parent, and then you can put it on your child. Well, there's some wisdom to that, right? Because you can't have parents out there suffocating because they don't have a quality job, because they can't keep the house together, because whatever is going on in their life, they're dealing with a mental health issue, and, and yet they're supposed to be fully present for the kid, like the same family that lives in a different community, in a different house, with, with different amenities. They're supposed to be able to care for that child equally. They're supposed to be present for the school equally. They're supposed to be able to catapult these young people from their current situation to a new situation. And so, um, and so we work with families. We deal every day with the challenges that our youth feel, youth, youth, youth live, right? And I wanna make sure folks understand that we deal with the wide range of challenges because those are the challenges our kids work, deal with. In fact, you know, while most of the victims of, 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 of the murders have been African Americans, there are young Latinos dying today. There are young Latinos shooting each other today, right? In fact, we lost two kids. Okay, we lost Michael Orozco, a 14-year-old, about three years ago, and we lost Angel Cano, a 16-year-old. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's not just the kids you lose, it's the kids whose education gets interrupted because of all the things going on in their lives, coming in and out of um, detention centers, going in and out of you know, uh, 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 needing to go to jobs, right? I mean, you're dealing with everything. And so we look at ourselves as an education innovation laboratory. We're not gonna make all the difference in Chicago, but if there are some things that we can learn, then we can share that with others. That's our mindset. And so let me just tell you the few things that we've been learning, right? A few things that we're learning are these. Okay, first of all, I said it before. You've got to work with the whole family, not just the students themselves. You've got to make that whole family whole at the end of the day. And so we need to think more about families, not just students. When you think about family, you think about community, right? Peace. Peace and restoration is cle clear, cle clearly important in our country right now. You know, I think, uh, you know, what, what hockey is really speaking to, at least the way it comes to me, right, is just we've lacked peace and restoration, right? Full restoration, right? And you have to do that. You have to do that in every instance, in every situation. And so the way we think about peace, you know, if you come to our schools, we have peace circles, we have distorted practices, but they don't just come in when you have a big problem. They come in when you have any situation. <laughs> so that it becomes part of the culture that we come together in peace circles and we restore justice. I'll share a quick story, but yesterday I was with three, I mean, Friday, Saturday I was with three young women, three young women and their teacher. And their teacher uh, explains the toughest time he ever had in teaching them was when these three young women collided with each other in his class. And it was a phenomenal collision, right? Well, the three young women come up to me and said, and, and one of them wrote this beautiful eulogy that I was able to hear. Because by the way, one of the things we do is we ask our kids to write a eulogy because they're thinking about death anyway. So we might as well ask them to think about what contributions they're gonna make in life that are positive, right? That are uplifting, that help the person next to them, you know, as they think about death, right? And we learn a lot. So this young woman wrote the most beautiful eulogy and I said to her, right? Um, hey, you got a several books in you. And she goes, I know, but I got my first book. I said, what's your first book? She's my first book is it all began in a circle. And it was two other young women, right? They were part of that terrible situation. And they were standing right behind me. And they said, we're going to co-author a book. It all began in a circle, right? 
and their perspective. And so circles matter. Those kinds of practices matter. They matter in the lives of children. They matter in all instances. They matter in all places, including workplaces, by the way. We ought to practice that in our workplaces. That might make them more healthy. Competencies, right? We teach life competencies embedded into our curriculum. And I want to share just quick. Fighter for freedom. <laughs> is a competency so that you can learn discipline for freedom versus punishing. Humanizing healer so that you can actually learn to be fully human. A voice for justice so that you can actually learn how to use your voice for good, not just to intimidate or manipulate. <laughs> we have to teach our children when voices are coming at them that are trying to intimidate and manipulate so that they can learn how to use their voice in the right way. Critical questioner so that you can learn how to deconstruct and reconstruct meaning, right, through critical questions. And scholar for transformation, so that you can learn how to use praxis, right, how to use action and, 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 and reflection to get to a good place. So what's another thing we've learned? Opportunities. Opportunities to align what you're doing in the world Right with what you want to do. What, what opportunities are there with what you want to do? I'm going to give you three quick stories. Fabian. Fabian's a young entrepreneur. He was dealing drugs in our school. <laughs> a bit of a problem, right? <laughs> okay, but doggone it. He's a good entrepreneur. I'm telling you he's a good entrepreneur. He was totally turned out, tuned out. Fabian's going to graduate this year. We didn't kick him out. We didn't push him out. We worked with him. We're going to help Fabian be a very successful businessman, and he will be a very successful businessman. Jamie. Jamie was in the DCFS system since the first grade. Jamie had a hard time understanding when people came to her to love her. We had to teach Jamie what it meant to be loved, right? And we had to teach Jamie what it meant to trust, right? Jamie is volunteering, being a mentor to kids after school because she loves that opportunity. And uh, Nancy, Nancy does... Uh, uh, we'll go insulin injections every single day. She's a diabetic. And she's preparing to be a nurse to care for diabetic young people. And so, yeah, how can you align young people's experiences and talents to what they need to do? The last thing I want to say is leg up on college and career. We got to give young people a leg up. And boy, are they hungry for a leg up. They're extremely hungry. Let me just tell you a little data point here. Um, we organize our school day. So that Monday through Thursday, you go to school from 8 to 4. Friday, you get off at 1. Teachers get a chance to take a breather, work together, do some collaborative things. And then just a quick thing about our school. Our, we, we run two charter schools, two unionized charter schools, unionized by choice. We don't fight our faculty. We work with our faculty, right, to come up with the right solutions. And so on Fridays, what the young people are doing is out of 350 juniors and seniors, 100 of them are choosing to stay on Friday, not leave. 75 of them are getting health care certifications so that they can be a CNA by the time they graduate. 25 of them want to get into manufacturing. Next week, I got a meeting with Comtia. We'll get some folks into the IT world, right? And so when children are given high quality choices that link them to jobs, they actually take them <laughs> on their own accord and on their own time. So I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, uh, there is passion, and the problem is multifaceted mm -hmm. and large. And sometimes it's so large, um, we become numb to it because we don't know how we're going to be able to get our arms around it. One of the things that we're doing as a group at the Chicago Urban League is reading The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. And the book talks about a number of different issues that our community faces, and we are looking at how much they relate to what is happening here today. The title of the book comes from a, a spiritual, which is God told Noah that the rainbow Gave, God gave Noah the rainbow sign. The rain's going to end, but it's fire next time. Are we in the fire right now? What are the biggest issues that we need to face as a city, knowing that 30% of our population is African American and 30% of our population is Latino? That's a large portion of our community. That's the pipeline 
for the workforce, that's the pipeline for consumers. What are the biggest problems that we face right now for these youth? Anyone? Mm. <laughs> I got. Oh, okay, go ahead, Rolf. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Rufus, go ahead. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone because I don't want to follow hockey anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the next word. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say, uh, hockey spoke truth, and I love his truth, and I'm glad he was here to, to share that. Uh, it's real, and I think all that we see is, uh, are the symptoms of the things that he, that he spoke of. Uh, when we think about what's really necessary and what's gonna, gonna move our, our people forward, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy when I had a chance to look around the room and I see a lot of people here who I work with when I was at the Board of Education. And with all the things in every place that we look, that we see, that we think, and that we talk about, it's education that's tantamount. It's education that's truly important. It's education that's number one. So when we think about our youth, and I was thinking about just the, the process and the question and the thought of, um, you know, what's the biggest challenge facing our youth? Our youth should be in school. Our youth should be students. When we're in Lincoln Park, we don't talk about the joblessness of our youth uh, because they're all going to college. But we're in Lawndale and Inglewood and other places, we talk about joblessness. What we need to think about is what should happen with our children that empowers them as they get ready to go to school, that empowers their families, that gives them the opportunity to really go and participate fully in, in society. I think uh, the Urban League recently put out a report that talked about uh, the number of 16 to 24 year olds who are out of work and out of school. And the number is embarrassingly high. But the reality is, if you're 18, if you're 21, we shouldn't be talking about jobs. They should be students, and students should study. And they should be somewhere in high school or they should be somewhere in college. So what keeps that from happening? I know where I am, it's helped a lot when education is important in your family because your parents can make that so. Uh, when Hockey spoke about some of the policies, when he spoke particularly about mass incarceration and what that does to upset the fabric of a family and what happens when a young person goes to jail, comes back out of jail, or an old person comes back out and can't find a job, and so you, re re you resort back to this underground economy or whatever it was that got you there because although you may not have to check the box, the box is real and the questions get asked and given the option, you don't hire that person, but people have to live and people have to survive. So what we have to do is find ways to stop that mass incarceration, to stop that fabric of, of our families and of our communities from being broken so that they can truly be rebuilt. Once that family is intact, then we can focus on things like education. We can make sure that when children are born, our parents have enough prenatal care, they're doing enough reading, they're doing enough thoughtfulness, they're feeding them right, that it's not um, a food desert, which is what we experience where I am, where you don't have to every time you see someone, every time you go to a vendor, you look at them through a bulletproof glass. It is where some things that are truly abnormal have become normal. And it is not the kind of situation that any of us would accept, but it's the kind of situation that is always there. So when we look forward and think about what can really happen, what can we do, we need to really impact policies that cause people to be locked up for reasons by which they should never be locked up. Uh, nothing could be clearer when we start to think about what's happening as we, as we consider uh, the reaction to um, the heroin epidemic. And now we consider that and we consider what work needs to be done with heroin addicts and the care and love that's given to them versus those who struggle with crack, who then went to jail by the score and can't find anything to do when they get out. And so that was not at all treated as a health epidemic, but it was treated as a crime by which people should be locked up and families and communities are destroyed. And it is what we deal with every day in these communities because we have to deal with the children from these broken families and trying to make sure they get up and get on and get educated. So we have a chance, but we have a choice. And we have to really engage ourselves in looking at what these policies are and advocating for the changes in, in those. Thank you. 
Juan? I'd like to jump in right where Rufus took off because he said there's a choice. I mean, I think there's clearly, I don't think there, there's anyone in this room who would disagree that there's enough abundance in this city. There's enough abundance in this nation. Abundance of not just financial resources, but time and talent and energy and creativity in order to solve the challenges that we're facing in every community for every child. That abundance exists. The question is, why isn't that abundance being brought to the table, in fact, for those children? And, you know, when you ask the question, you know, are we in the fire? I, I mean, yeah, we're, we're in the fire. The problem is that, because um, if any of us are in a fire, all of us are in a fire. You can't have a fire in your society that's growing without putting it out, otherwise um, then you're just leaving it up to Mother Nature to do it on its own, right? <laughs> um, and so, so I think that we're in a fire. The problem is that, there, that, that not everybody believes we're, we're in the fire. Not everybody is immediately in the fire right now, right? And so there's this indifference <laughs> that exists in our society. We can get along, we can get by, we can get ahead um, without solving the problem. We could move. <laughs> we could do lots of different things. We can create choices for ourselves. You know, the thing I learned the most in East St. Louis was from those families who had a ton of choices, right? And they were sticking it out. <laughs> they were sticking it out. Uh, they had lost value in their homes. Um, they deal with, were dealing with situations of, you know, that quite frankly they didn't have to deal with, right? But they chose to deal with it, right? And that's not just for them, that's for all of us. We have to choose to deal with it as a society. We have to choose to take action. We have to move away from indifference. And we have to be really champions for that. That means that everywhere you go, if someone's indifferent, you have to challenge that. We have to challenge indifference in our kitchen tables, on our holidays, wherever it's uncomfortable, we have to challenge it. Because until we get there, where people are actually doing something, right, uh, we're, we're not gonna harness that abundance that actually exists in our society. Thank you. I, I'm gonna uh, serve up something uh, to Haki because um, I think that he's, he's got some answers. And one of the things that we don't want to do is to continue to outline the problem that we know exists already. We want to start to talk about what are some of the solutions. Um, and I think that basically everybody in the audience and everybody outside of this building needs to start to think about what's an action item? What can we do? to change the trajectory for our kids. What should everybody leave here thinking about that they can do individually? The um, problem is that there are two levels of justice in the country. You have a justice system for the overground economy. You have a justice system for the underground economy. Until we begin to understand essentially that these two justice systems exist, and of course the overground economy that, you know, 1% or more control the justice in the country. A few white men literally committed the crime of the century that produced a 2008 2009 meltdown in the country and in internationally. They're not in jail, they got bonuses. The banks got bailed out. You don't think the brothers and sisters in Juan's community and Rufus community and my community can see that? That these two levels of justice exist? And Juan talk about choices. Well, we make choices within the parameters of other people's decisions. You see what I'm saying? People make the decisions and we make choices within the context of their decisions so we're not even making decisions about our own lives. I've seen this over 50 years. Yeah, we have four schools. We deal with a thousand children a day in an African-centered education. And the one thing that we teach our children that, we, that I think we all can agree on, if you don't know who you are, That's right. anybody can name you. That's right. And they do. <clears throat> Leroy, Jane. My point is that essentially, until we understand what's happening with these people, they run it. They run the world. This is the latest issue of Forbes the richest people in the damn world. 
about maybe five or six black people, all right, from Africa and a few here. Oprah's here. She only got she only worth three billion dollars. That's not even serious money among these people. Paul uh, 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 Gates is worth seventy nine billion dollars. Buffett seventy three billion dollars. So you talk about if you got students coming out of college and university today with a one point four trillion dollar student debt going back home. You got the rich don't even care about their own people. What do you care about us? And we don't have the resources, really, to fight this war at the level we need to fight it. Resources. And so my wife, my, my wife is a PhD from the University of Chicago. She ain't nobody's damn dummy. I mean, she, I mean, she had a dial chair at Northwestern University. We started these schools over 40 some odd years ago. And you only got the charter schools when they came out. And they denied us the charter. Mm. We had to go to fight for the charter because they didn't want to teach anything about Africa. All right? So it's always a fight. It's always a battle. You always got to bring your face, your face. Uh, 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 Christoph had a piece in last Sunday, two, two Sundays ago, when whites just don't get it, revisit it. This was uh, 4316 New York Times, Sunday New York Times. Y'all know about the Panama Papers? Anybody who do not know about the Panama Papers? That's what's happening in the country. So you got these two levels. You got an overground economy, you got an underground economy. All right? Now what do we do? We have always said black people, Hispanics, others, need independent black institutions that are working day and night for their, nobody's lobbying for us 24-7. But you go up on the Capitol Hill, you got you know, four or 500 lobbyists for the major banks in this country, for the major insurance company, nobody's lobbying for us. We got to build it ourselves. So can I, can I get um, one to two minutes from each of you to answer that question? What can we walk away with today? What can we do individually and collectively to change this? So I, I do think that uh, going back to independent black and Latino institutions, it, that, that, that speaks to owning things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that a big fundamental shift is mm -hmm. we've got to become owners, owners of everything. We've got to become owners. And to become owners, we have to work with each other, right? Um, we ought to you know, own cities in a sense of running them, <laughs> right? being the mayors of them. We ought to own governorships, right? Because I did learn in college, the course was the political economy. It wasn't the economy political, right? <laughs> the, the course was properly titled that politics does drive economic opportunity in so many ways. And so, but we've got to become owners. I see Jim Reynolds here, right? I mean, you know, people like Jim um, represent, you know, folks moving into ownership. So we have to own businesses. Just think about everything that we need to own. But I do think it starts by owning schooling to a great degree and owning the story in schooling. Because if you can own schooling and the story in schooling, then you're capturing the most essential, which is what's in young people's minds and spirits, right? Um, and when you say owning, it's not taking thing, anything away from anybody else. It's bringing something into an environment, right? So sometimes we think you own at the expense of others, and I don't believe in that model. Rufus? So this is my third time speaking at the City Club. The first time I spoke, I talked about school funding and the need to have adequate school funding for all of our schools. I hope that whatever I say today will be embraced greater than that, because obviously we didn't get there from, from that speech. But I will tell you that it is still critically important with everything that we do. Uh, what can we do? What can you do? What can people individually do? You can care. You can give a damn. Um, what we need are advocates. We need people to really push and cajole and lobby and vote and get others to vote and empower our communities and empower our people. We need to provide targeted opportunities for our young people. They need to have a chance. They need to have an opportunity. They need to know what those opportunities are and we need to present those things to them. Support our work. Support BBF Family Services. Support other organizations. Support what we're doing financially. Support what we're doing with volunteers. It's all critically important. When you see these terrible stories on the news, don't shake your head and walk away. Shake your head and walk in, because we need help. And those families and those children need help.
give voice to those who are, who are affected and really ignore and challenge the colloquialism of gang-related. What does that mean? Nobody really understands. What it means is that something has happened and young children are making decisions that they don't know the consequences of those decisions. We have to ask why and we have to get in and we have to help. Can I just give four, four things and I'll just be quiet? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, you mentioned you know Jim Reynolds and others who are here. I mean, I'm 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 tired of being part of the bigger, the bigger. You know, we're begging all the time for resources. Okay, and you're right. I mean, but ownership starts with ownership of self. If you don't know who you are, then you own it from somebody else. And so, I say there are four unconditionals that all people must have, but most certainly black people must have in terms of dealing with our own community, because the most difficult people to deal with are your own people in many cases. One, there must be unconditional love. It's unconditional love for self, one's family, people, all children. It doesn't matter what culture, all children. Two, there must be unconditional courage. I mean, people say, why do you do this for 50, I mean, why do you keep doing this kind of work? It's because of unconditional love, all right, especially for children. But you have to have this courage, always to question authority, injustice, greed, dishonesty, and corruption, all the time. Three, unconditional search. Knowledge for knowledge and hard facts and enlightenment and hidden answers and truth within the truth and moral questions within the daily noise of corporate consumerism, a buy and sell culture. And finally, the fourth unconditional will is unconditional will. This will to appreciate and be aware of the power of the creative uh, individualism of one, what one person can do against great odds. But also understand the very importance around organization and struggle each and every day. And then finally, Juan mentioned voting. Yes, we, we had to vote, but you know, Republicans are voting suppression all over the country. This is a New York Times editorial, uh, April 5th, voter suppression. So we got all these forces coming up against us. And this is why it's so important in terms of how do you generate serious money? You can't generate serious money with a job. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna, you wanna, I have six really great questions, but I won't ask them, but I will, but I will say this, that um, clearly this is um, passionate, um, and if we all get this passionate about our youth, we can make a change. It's critical, it's the fire, it's the time, we have to do something now. Um, and it, 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 affects, it impacts everyone. It's not just about youth of color. It impacts everyone. And I really thank uh, the City Club for allowing us to have this very open and frank conversation today. And I thank our panelists, each one of you, for being so open and honest with your answers. Thank you. <laughs>